Our next email comes from Bon Turkington. Whoa. He says, Hi, Damon and the Scoop crew. I hope this week finds you well. Have you been found well? Uh, I, I'm pretty well. I'm all right. Yeah. You can find me well all the time. This will likely be seen as another landmark year for gaming, as two new technologies are going to be fully implemented. I'm talking about VR and Nintendo's NX, both of which continue to evolve how games are played and interacted with. Books, and to a lesser extent movies, do not really change over time. A book as a collection of words between pages will never really become obsolete, and movies will almost always involve passively watching a show. 100 years from now, books and movies will still be just as enjoyable as they are now. However, can the same be said about games? I'm wondering if you think there will come a point in the near future, say another 20 years, where we simply won't be able to go back and play old games from the NES, Super NES, or even PS3 and beyond because VR and other technology of the day has completely eclipsed them. So there's yeah. this real, real smart dude named C.S. Lewis who said that reading <coughs> old books is, is very valuable because it's kind of like traveling through time. Hmm. You read an old book and you can read something from the context of a generation that doesn't exist anymore. You can look into their brains and see how they saw the world in a different way than you see the world. They have different assumptions. Old games can do the same thing. You go back and play a game from the 1970s, early 1980s, and you see that people were thinking in different ways. And I think that's the greatest strength of old games, is this sort of magical time capsule ability. Just like looking at the stars and seeing light from something that may not even be there anymore, it's sort of the same sort of experience. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a uh, turkey man. Von turkey man. Von yep. turkey man. Yep. <laughs> Justin, will video games stand the test of time? Yeah, I mean, I actually think Turkington uh, makes a great point, and this is something that I've thought a lot about, uh, is I really, really like video games. I've made my career playing video games, um, so I, I believe in this medium, but they definitely have strange, I don't know if it's disadvantages, uh, but the technology changing, I mean, I guess it's really defined like what a movie is. Like it's, you know, 90 minutes to three hours, and you're gonna sit in a theater and you're gonna watch this film, and like there's, there's a common understanding of like how long a book will be, but a video game can be, you a 99 cent, it can be super hexagon, or it can be a 100 hour RPG, and those both fit into, those are both counted as video games, and we yeah. both cover, we cover both of those on IGN, and they couldn't possibly be more different, you know, from visual novels to things that have literally no story at all, mm -hmm. and nothing else is like that, like books don't have that problem, albums don't have that problem, maybe it's not a problem, maybe it's an opportunity, but yeah. it's interesting to think about uh, just how reliant we are on the technology of the day, and people will argue that films are like that too, but it's not the same. Like a movie from the 50s is still commonly understood as a movie, whereas a video game, you know, from, from the, you know, Atari era just has nothing in common almost from a video game, you know, from The Witcher 3. Uh, so it's interesting. I don't really know what that yeah. means for the long-term future of games. It's interesting mm -hmm. that he brings up VR. I just mm -hmm. finished Ready Player One, and uh, that... Is, talks about a VR-centric universe where everybody's living in VR, but they go play old arcade games as part of in VR. what happens yeah. Yeah, in, in the game. So it's an emulation within. But uh, that brings me to my point. Uh, games are incredibly hard to preserve. We're doing a terrible job at it. Mm. And when you play an emulated game, you play a preserved game right now, I don't think it's the experience that people ever got with that game. Uh, sitting on the CRT screen yeah. with an NES plugged in uh, is the way to play Super Mario Brothers or DuckTales. Uh, it's very hard for me to connect that experience with emulating it on any other any other device, mm -hmm. and uh, that that is like people say like well that's that's you can do that with any like, Xbox controller and a PC, whatever you cannot do that with the vast majority of arcade machines in any way. Mm -hmm. There's no way to take a 720 cabinet and make it experienceable for people now without making it that cabinet. Yeah. yeah. Kind of and it's really ball, sad. Or even just the, the look and feel of a joystick or even, I mean, even or something the as screen. Simple. The graphics are very yeah. important and yeah. the screens are all wrong. I mean, that actually touches on, you know, the point that I was making about, you know, being reliant on, like video games are reliant on input in a way that no other artistic medium is. Uh, so, you know, you can emulate Mario on your PC and, you know. Or take it on your iPhone. Yeah, or on your iPhone. And you can even add, I mean, even if you have a great physical controller, it's not an NES controller. And yeah. so it's different. Mm -hmm. It is a subtly different experience. And that's just a weird thing that, uh, you know, that no other medium really has to deal with or contend with. And I completely agree that I am concerned about the preservation of games and actually laws sort of make the preservation of games uh, difficult. I think that's yep. kind of backwards. Um, and even outside of just the legal ramifications, you know, MMOs go offline. And these are these real important experiences yeah. that sometimes yeah. thousands or That's hundreds good, of thousands of people had, and they're just gone. Like, yeah. you can't, or even, and I, I feel like I brought this up on Scoop maybe a month or so ago, mm -hmm. but uh, even games that are still online, like World of Warcraft Cataclysm, 
uh, changed it, wiped away the old world. That was mm -hmm. the that was the whole conceit of that expansion. Was it wiped away the old world and replaced all the zones with new? You know, it pushed the story forward a few years, and it's like it made me uncomfortable because now you can't experience. Yeah, that think old of the game equipment it would take to resurrect it too. Is all dated server equipment. Yeah, well, yeah people actually, can't, I mean, fan made attempts have been like you mm -hmm. can like they are preserving that stuff, but that's sort of outside the mm -hmm. law. Um, so yeah. people are doing it. But not in any kind of official sanctioned way, and I don't. I'm not. I don't think I'm okay with that. Yeah, that's that's something that people have been fighting for rights for special allowances this year, actually, for for cases almost exactly like what you're describing. And that's a constant fight that people have to make to say, you know, what preservation versus business. And unfortunately, and I, I do think it's unfortunate, uh, the almighty dollar does kind of rule in these situations, yeah. and people are very protective of their intellectual property. I want people to be able to, to profit off what they've created. But, Absolutely. And, but, but, the, but at the expense of losing something that was, that was art, that is art, yeah. for the sake of the human race, it's, it, we need to lean a little more on the side of what you well, said, preservation. I, I don't know if that story is apocryphal or not, but didn't Nintendo lose the Donkey Kong source code? We don't know if that's we true. We don't know if they lost it but or they, somebody They outsourced else it, it and somebody else might own that code. Because yeah. they never issue it. I mean, mm. th the thing the, that would prove us wrong is if Nintendo just put it out. Donkey Kong. The like, vertical monitor Donkey yeah, Kong like that asks how high can you get. They yeah. may have it, but it may belong to somebody else. That's, mm. that there's, there's a lot of possibilities. But I mean, think about like, this. Games were played on a one picture tube, a CRT screen, uh, for the entire life of games until 2005. Mm -hmm. And those are no longer in production anywhere. The yeah. CRT? Yeah, anywhere. You, you, you have to you refurbish an old one mm -hmm. to do that. So the way every game was designed to look, if we think of games as art and as a visual medium, the way DuckTales looks on a CRT screen was designed so Scrooge's eyes blur the right way using yep. the CRT monitor so it looks like a cartoon character. Mm. But anytime you play it on a virtual console, it's the jagged little pixel boxes. And we all wear like clothes with like pixel art and yeah. stuff. Like pixel yeah. art didn't exist. It didn't look like pixels, yeah. exactly. And, and, other the game scoop and it's not just pixel art that suffers from that. You think about something like uh, uh, Super Mario RPG that had those those pre-rendered sprites in it, and yeah. you look at them on a modern TV, and you're just like, ugh. What's going but on there? But when they were yeah. all softened. They look like clay softened yeah, they, models. They, they, they kind of look like models. And they and try to a, cover off on stuff like that with software, yeah. and mm -hmm. none of it's really that great. And I know. appreciate the efforts that people sure. make in that, though. I mean. Anyway, yeah. game preservation, we're screwed. Is, is there anything stopping someone at some point in the future for from manufacturing CRT monitors again? No, there's Money. not. Profit. <laughs> it'd be, yeah. it'd be saying, a little like, crazy. It's not like the, the materials you need to make them are but, gone. But, but hey, like I restore these old games all the yeah. time and old pinball machines and, and people manufacture insane parts for those. I mean, the yeah. it's happen. definitely too, like it's the hardware side and the software side and both are problematic. Um, the software side is at least solvable. Um, there's weird stuff around, like, uh, I come from a mobile games background, and, like, remember old flip phones would have, like, mm -hmm. games on them? And, like, I'm not saying that those games are huge artistic achievements, and it's important. It's just weird to me that they're gone. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. weird to me that they're gone. Not archived. And they just don't, like, John Romero made games for flip phones, yeah. mm -hmm. and, like, y they just don't exist anywhere anymore, and no one seems to really care that much. And think much. about yeah. the update, the pre-updated versions of Xbox Live games. I mean, yep. I mean th there's there's archivists that believe that all of that needs to be archived for various reasons. We went to a talk uh, from the Internet Archive where, the, where at GDC last year where they talked about how uh, game code for games that never came out never gets out unless somebody yeah. steals it from work. Yeah, they were just like, please steal from work. It was amazing. But God bless those guys because they have made a huge effort with the resources they have available mm -hmm. to collect and save as much as they can. Something they continue to do. I, I encourage everybody to support that. But that raises another issue you were talking about the hardware, and even if this stuff does become accessible again, there's 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 also the threshold of expense and accessibility. I mean, the yeah. most becomes it? a boutique industry. Mm -hmm. How do we pay for it? How do we get it into people's hands so they can explore the history? That's the other half of it. Yeah, I think it needs to be like a Library of Congress movement, and yeah. It, yeah. that's just not happening. Yeah. I do want to say that part of this is we think it's unique to games, and I even said you know a minute ago that it's unique to games, but there are challenges. People that are just as into books as we are into games. Um, it wasn't until, like, Kindles have been around for years, but until super recently, the Kindle software didn't try to emulate. It would put line breaks in weird places, mm -hmm. and it wasn't... I don't even know enough about novels to really have the vocabulary to articulate this point thoroughly, except that the way that per words are laid out on a printed page is different than how they would appear on a Kindle. Yes. And it wasn't until the most recent Amazon Kindle update that they made an effort to finally mm -hmm. fix that mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, have it look more like... 
you know, the oh, authorial that's intent. Yeah. yeah, I mean, books always say, like, who did the typesetting and stuff still. Like, yeah. that's, like, a yep. popular like, thing. Like, they to, finally to, fixed to the typesetting on Kindles for big bookies. And, yeah, you know, I'm sure... Bookies. Like, I'm sure people... Bookers. Like, bookers, yeah. You know, it's, no, it's probably not radically different than seeing a film on film. You know, there, there are these concerns in other mediums, but yeah. I think they're definitely amplified and multiplied in video yeah, games. Yeah. Mm. It will be very, very interesting to see what happens with VR. Uh, whether or not that changes the way we yeah, play can, games. Can or, a Donkey Kong machine be emulated so perfectly in VR that it's indistinguishable from real life? Of course, oh. that will happen. But who, <laughs> who's going to do that? Yeah. And what will that look like? And who can license it? And I don't know, but when they do, I shall play it yeah, me too. a lot. But that's what Ready Player One is about, which is going to be a Steven Spielberg movie. Yeah, so. that's true. It begins this year. We'll see what happens with It begins. All <laughs>